Yay. Okay, awesome. Thank you all for having me. Um, it's really nice to come back to Canada. I'm originally from Ottawa. Uh, I live in the Bay Area, so I saw that. Um, so I'm going to talk about for Spark, and I'm going to talk on what Spark is and, and sort of some of the terms I'm going to use, but this is not really a Spark intro talk in and of itself. If you If you don't know Spark, um, there's some resources I'll encourage you to check out afterwards. Um, so I'm Holden. Uh, my preferred pronouns are she or her. I have it tattooed on my wrist in case you forget. Um, like, like, yeah, I'm a principal software engineer at IBM, um, and I've been at a bunch of companies, mostly working on sort of big data and search and recommendation problems. Uh, I'm a co-author of Learning Spark and an even earlier Spark book called Fast Data Processing with Spark. And I'm a co-author of another Spark book that is not yet out, um, but I will definitely try and get you all to buy several copies of. Um, it makes a great gift for your dog. I, I, <laughs> it's, it's good. Um, and anyone who will not read it. Um, but anyways, you can follow me on Twitter uh, if you want pictures of cats or complaints about the American healthcare system. Um, occasionally intermixed is programming in Scala. Um, for more serious stuff, you can you can check out my SlideShare, um, and the slides from today's talk, I will I'll definitely put them up on SlideShare, and slides from a bunch of my other talks are also up there. Um, I forgot I was tethered, so oh, cool. there. Thank you. <clears throat> the internet will be useful, maybe. Um, if you want to connect with me for business business numbers, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I have some Spark related projects up on GitHub. And I also have some of the videos from some of my previous talks, uh, and they're just they're just this bitly link here. Um, and so if this recording ends up working out, I'll, I'll put it up there as well, so you can you can find it in the YouTube playlist. And if it doesn't work out, there's like an earlier version of this talk with less cool stuff um, that is that is up there. Um, oh, started. Okay, cool. One second. Can everyone hear me okay? Is, is this? What? <laughs> recording? I guess it. Yeah, it's recording. Sorry, my bad. No, that's cool. Okay. Yeah. Your full screen. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm going to start with sort of some of my assumptions about you all, besides mostly being Canadian. Um, I'm going to talk about why you should test and validate your, your Spark programs. Um, and this is maybe preaching to the choir since you bothered to come to a testing Spark meetup. Uh, but just in case you're on the fence, um, I'll take a quick detour and sort of to some of the Spark terms that I'm going to use uh, throughout the talk. Um, we'll look at sort of normal unit testing with Spark. Uh, we'll talk about how to do like testing at scale because probably the reason why you're using Spark is you have too much data, and just doing really simple unit tests isn't going to cut it. Um, and we'll talk about some of the specific considerations for working with uh, Spark streaming and uh, Spark SQL, uh, which is pretty much the future. Spark SQL is, is taking over a lot of the other pieces of Spark. Um, there will be some bits on how to do job validation, and there will be cute and scary pictures um, at least one panda and at least one cat. Um, there, I was going to put in some pictures of Pokemon um, for the Pokemon Go people, but since this is a testing talk, I decided to put in pictures of where Pokemon Go crashed. Um, so yeah. So I'm hoping you're all nice. If you're not, just pretend to be nice. Uh, if you don't like silly pictures, you're going to have to ignore the top corner of my slides. Um, how many people? have used Spark in the room? OK, OK. How many people have not used Spark in the room? Cool. OK, that's pretty good. Um, so if you haven't used Spark, don't worry. Uh, I will cover the, the terms that I'm using here. Uh, but if you actually want to go ahead and use Spark later, you're, you're going to probably want an intro video or something. Um, you can buy one of my books. Uh, I think learning Spark is pretty good, uh, but I'm obviously pretty biased. Um, this is the Scala meetup, so everyone's familiar with Scala, more or less, I'm hoping. And if not, 
Uh, I do have a version of this talk with Python slides, and you can find them in the <laughs> slide share. Um, I'm sorry. I, I work with data scientists. They like Python. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyways, and I'm hoping you all want to build better software. Um, if you don't, I mean, there's, there's pizza. <laughs> and Coke, too. Oh, pizza and Coke. Wonderful. So why should we test? It makes you a better person. Coming to this talk is a good first step to being a better person. It avoids making your users angry. I swear so much at that Pokemon Go app. And that's just not good. You, you want your users to be happy rather than like cursing that they can't catch Magic Carp. Um, it helps you save money. AWS is kind of expensive. Um, and raising money is hard right now, maybe. Um, so if you can get your tests you know, to actually run, um, rather than just breaking things in production, you'll save yourself a bunch of money. Um, and waiting for our jobs to fail is a really long development cycle, right? And I think this is the one that we probably most, most feel, right, as developers. Um, when we're doing our work and, you know, we don't know if it's going to actually work, we just don't make as much uh, improvements. And it's, it's just kind of sad, right? Like, we sit there and we're like, well, if I change this, it might break, and then I'm going to get paged at 2 a.m., Mm, I'm just going to tell the user we can't do this, right? But if you have a really good, you know, test set, you can feel confident in refactoring. You can feel confident in making your code run faster. It's going to be great. Totally useful. Um, but this is really just giving you flashbacks to your QA internships for anyone who had one of those and reminding you that you don't want to get aboard the failed boat. The failed boat is a very sad boat to be on. <coughs> so, I think most people are already convinced that, that software testing is good, um, and that's great. But software validation is perhaps something that people don't do as much. Um, I think it's really important to know when we're on the fail boat so that we can avoid doing things that are going to make the fail boat worse. Um, you can halt your deployments. You can do rollbacks. You can avoid doing terrible things and suggesting bad things to your users. I have personally written software which made terrible suggestions to users. Um, and I didn't know it because I, I didn't actually have any good validation around it. And we pushed it out to prod, and I had a very stressful three days of trying to fix all of the problems I caused. Um, sometimes your data sources are going to fail in new and exciting ways. Um, how many people read AFER's blog of uh, Call Me Maybe? OK, if you don't, I, I really encourage you to take a look at it. It's a fascinating blog, and it has a lot of really interesting stuff about how most distributed systems are crap. And they're going to lose your data, and they're going to corrupt things randomly, and you're going to be kind of sad. Um, and you're going to want to detect when you're in this error state so you don't do bad things. Um, one of the big things is that the jerk on the other floor, definitely not you, but someone else in your organization, is going to change the meaning of one of the fields in your schema. And it's just going to break at runtime. Everything looks fine at compile time, but someday, without even doing your own deployment, your job is going to go from working to failing, and you're going to be really sad, and you should know when it happens. Um, the other one is, like, as much as we know that software testing is really important, we just don't have the time to test absolutely everything, right? Very few of us have test coverage of even, like, 98%, right? And we're still going to always find some cases that we didn't manage to properly test. And when we fail, we should minimize the impact, yeah. Can you just uh, explain why? How do you, uh, what your definition of testing versus validate, just so clarify sure. what so, the difference in your eyes? In, in my eyes, the, the testing is I'm going to make a test suite that I'm going to run. It can include unit tests. It can include integration tests. But it's a thing that I run on my code, and it tells me I'm good, or I did bad things, or the CI server is having a bad day. Um, and validation is my code is running in production. It's doing something, and I'm reasonably confident that my job is actually doing the right thing, or if it does something weird, it's going to tell me, right? It's, it's sort of some metrics or things that we capture about the work that we're doing at runtime so that we can, we can make intelligent decisions there. Awesome. Yeah, once again, fail boat, very sad. You don't want to go on it. Um, another good reason is a lot of people automatically use the results of their job, um, which is kind of interesting, right? Like if you're if you're writing a Spark job, uh, about a quarter of people that I surveyed said that they automatically just take the results 
from their Spark job and start using it in production. Uh, and that's that's cool, but you should like probably do some sanity checking and make sure that the results are actually reasonable. Um, and if you're not convinced yet, you probably <laughs> won't be. Um, <clears throat> but <laughs> so surprisingly, 53.3% of people said they didn't have a serious production outage from Spark. I think those people are lying or don't use Spark yet. <laughs> um, and 10% and of people say, yes, we've had a serious outage because of Spark. And a lot of other people aren't really sure what serious is. It's like, I still have my job. The company didn't go under per se. We're in like receivership, but I'm still getting paid. Um, so anyways, uh, on a related note, if you, if you have your own experiences working with Spark and you want to share them with me, I have this little survey link at the bottom. And I would love your feedback on what you're doing to test your Spark jobs. So why don't we test? We, we all know we should, um, but a lot of us have read excuses for not writing unit tests. Um, and at the end of the day, it's hard. Uh, especially testing Spark is really hard, right? We have to fake our data. We have to set up a fake cluster. It, it's a lot of work. Um, our tests can get really slow, especially if we're trying to test stuff at, at scale, right? If we're trying to do tests to make sure that we're not going to fail on big data sets. Well, we have to test on a big data set, and that's, that's just really slow inherently. Um, the other one is really uh, our boss comes to us and is like, hey, is, is this project done? And you're like, yeah, yeah. I just need to add some tests. And they're like, mm, let's ship it. What could go wrong, right? So, so don't tell your boss your, your, your job is done before you have a good test suite, right? This is how I accidentally deployed a Perl script to production once. That was <laughs> not a good week. Actually, not a good several months. Um, but yeah, so just, just make sure these excuses don't actually apply. Your code is not a special snowflake. It, it actually should follow the good engineering practices we've, we've come to know and love. Why don't we validate? I think a lot more people don't really perform validation at runtime on their big data jobs. Um, I think the main reason is we already tested our code. And what could go wrong? It worked yesterday. But this is the same logic that has led to a lot of really terrible things, right? This logic just doesn't hold up. It's going to fail. So hopefully you're convinced that it's worth hanging around and, and not going and getting pizza. Um, and this cat is just my, like, I've hopefully convinced you. Otherwise, here's a cute picture of a cat. Um, and we're going to get down to, down to sort of brass tacks. So for the few people who aren't super familiar with what Spark is, um, it's a general purpose distributed system. It has a really nice API. It's built in Scala. Um, I actually, it's, it's not on the slide, but one of the things that I love about Spark is that it lets me get Scala into places that I never thought I could. Uh, you can go to a bank and be like, hey, what's up? You should do this in Scala. And they're like, whoa. And then you're like, no, 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 for Spark. And they're like, oh. I read that in a magazine. I will take six of those. And you're like, uh, <laughs> OK. But it's, it's good, right? Um, Spark is, is sort of the Trojan horse of Scala in a lot of ways, I think. Um, and as someone that loves functional programming on a level that I can't fully express, <laughs> I like Spark. Um, <clears throat> it's an Apache project, uh, which is really cool. So it's open source. Uh, if you want to contribute to Spark, you can. Um, and I have another talk about how to contribute to Spark. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as it could be, uh, but it's, it's still really great. It's, it's community driven, and it's, it's able to do a lot of things. Um, and a lot of people really find Spark by Googling, why is my map jo MapReduce job slow, and how to make MapReduce faster, and being like, oh, Spark is 100 times faster. I'm going to use that. Um, and so Spark is, is really, if you're coming from a Hadoop MapReduce background, you can think of it as like a really awesome, fast version of MapReduce. Spark has a whole bunch of different components. Um, and this slide is a little bit out of date. Uh, for people that are using Spark 2.0, the, the organization would be a bit different. But there's this core layer. And on top of it, there's all sorts of really cool components. Um, there's Spark SQL and data frames. And on top of that, Spark ML is available. Um, so there's a machine learning library built on top of the, the SQL engine. Um, and there's also actually a streaming library built on top of the SQL engine. Uh, and it's they're, Varying it, but it's new for the 2.0 release. Um, there's language APIs for those of us that have to work in languages besides Scala. It's an option. Don't tell your boss about them at the start if you want to use Scala. Um, there's some graph tools. They're not really, 
practices we need. Uh, they're not really production ready craft tools. Um, <laughs> they're, they're really interesting, uh, but I would not use GraphX in production, uh, personally. Uh, there's also the old school machine learning library that's just built on top of Spark Core, uh, and it doesn't depend on sort of the SQL library. Um, it's not going to be the active library moving forward, so you'll want to use the new one. Um, but then there's also this giant set of community packages. Uh, so if what you're looking for isn't in Spark Core itself, and it turns out that a lot of testing stuff isn't really supported directly in Spark, uh, you're going to want to go to the community packages and sort of figure out you know, what it is that you can add to Spark. Um, yeah, and so this is pretty cool. Um, incidentally, one of the benefits of having a lot of these things be in the same project and ship together is that it, you can actually take your SQL stuff and then you can build some machine learning on top of it, and you don't have to go from a SQL system to a separate system and, and save your data in between, right? You can just keep it all in the same system and, and do all of your really cool processing here. Um, and it also means that, like, when the streaming people run into things that are kind of slow, they fix them because for streaming, like, low latency is super important. And for, like, regular batch processing, eh, I mean, eh, a few hundred milliseconds of latency on, like, a two-hour job, whatever. But for the streaming people, they go in and they fix them. And then even if you're working on sort of a batch job, you, you know, you save a few extra hundred milliseconds, um, which I'm sure is useful. Uh, but, but it is useful for the SQL people that want to do sort of interactive queries. Um, and, and data scientists, if you're supporting data scientists in your organization. So I'm going to use a bunch of specific terms in this talk. Uh, really, the, the, the most important one is RDD, for Resilient Distributed Dataset. Um, they're awesome, and they're sort of the core building block of, of most of Spark. And they're, they're done very differently than other distributed systems. Um, MapReduce uh, handles resiliency by writing the results out to, to multiple disks so that if a node fails, it's OK. It'll just go and read the results back from another node. No problems, right? Like, it depends on HDFS to provide its resiliency. Spark, on the other hand, says mm, writing to disks is kind of slow. Um, and writing to three disks across a network, that's really slow. Um, so it actually, instead, just keeps this sort of graph of the operations you've asked it to perform on an RDD. And if a node failure occurs, it just recomputes the part of the data that's missing. Um, and now recomputing the part of the data that's missing can actually mean recomputing all of the data under certain circumstances. Um, and that's when we have a shuffle and we can't figure out like exactly what's going on. But, but really, the important part here is RDDs, you can think of it as just a distributed collection, and there's a lot of really cool magic around them to make them work. Um, and data frames are awesome. Are, I, I know we got a boo for Python users earlier, but are there any pandas or R data frame users in the house? OK, cool. Wait, I thought the boo came from over there. I'm so, ah, OK. Well, so Spark data frames really aren't data frames, um, despite their name, right? If you're coming from pandas or R, you're going to need to lower your expectations um, of the kinds of operations you're going to be able to do. But you can, you can think of them in a very similar way to RDDs. They're resilient. Um, they're distributed. All of our operations are automatically distributed. And, and they're very cool. And they have some really interesting performance characteristics that are a whole separate talk unto themselves. Um, they're also, unfortunately, not compile time typed. Um, so you just have some runtime schema information. And as a Scala developer, I look at that and I feel sad. Um, and thankfully, data sets came along and got cut off the bottom of the screen. But data sets came along and, and gave us compile time typed information. Uh, so if you're finding yourself using data frames, just go ahead and use data set instead. You've got some really nice compile time type information. And in Spark 2.0, data frames are just becoming a special case of data sets anyways, where you don't have type information at compile time. So there's no particularly great reason to use them. Um, the, the last two sort of Spark-specific terms that, that are important is the Spark context. Um, and this is just like the window to our world. You can think of it as the connection to the cluster. Um, so when you're like loading your data or doing something there, your Spark context is, is going to be the thing which does that loading of the data. Um, and the SQL context is just the SQL version of that. Um, and now for Spark 2.0, they decided to rename it because the SQL context is now also used for machine learning stuff. So 
the SQL name was maybe a bit silly, so they changed it to Spark Session. Um, so in this talk, SQL context and Spark Session are, are sort of interchangeable. <clears throat> um, cool. So making a unit test in Spark uh, as a sort of artisanal roach bomb um, is, is actually not that hard. And this, this picture is supposedly real and from Brooklyn. Uh, they have artisanal roach bombs and hand fried ginger, which is a very, very reasonable 1350. Um, and coming from San Francisco, that actually looks reasonable. Um, but an artisanal Spark test is, is pretty simple. If we just want to test our, our Spark data, there's, there's a few things we need to do. Uh, we need to make sure that we have a Spark context available to actually like load some test data. And we also need to clean up our Spark context. And we also need to clear this one random property, which isn't cleared for some reason. Um, and this is, I mean, really simple. Um, and then you can go ahead and, and actually like write a really simple test here. Um, <clears throat> now, admittedly, doing a big data test on three elements is a bit of a stretch to call it a big data test. But this is a good step, right? We have a really, really simple test, right? Uh, we have our input. We have our expected output. Uh, and we can use the parallelize function on the Spark context to just take a local collection and turn it into a distributed <coughs> collection. And then once again, we use collect to take a distributed collection and bring it back to a local collection. And this is, this is pretty simple. Um, the most obvious downside of testing this way is we're limited to data that fits on a single machine. Um, the other problem is I had to write some boilerplate code by hand, and I don't like writing boilerplate code. Uh, so there's a bunch of options to sort of get rid of the boilerplate code. And they have actually very different uh, sort of, hmm, what would be the correct word? Uh, they have different ideas about what the right way is to test your software. Um, there's Spark Testing Base, which I obviously think is a great way to test your software. You might notice that it's on my GitHub, and the other software packages are on other people's GitHubs. So I have, naturally, my personal biases. Um, there's SS Check, which is a really cool project, despite my complete lack of involvement in it. Um, and it's, it's really awesome. We'll talk about it in a bit. Um, there's a really new package that just came out for doing sort of business logic only tests. Um, and what this does is it does mock RDDs as opposed to creating a Spark context. Uh, so it just stubs out a lot of the operations and takes them for you. And that's OK. You don't get the full like experience. Um, but if you're running the problem of like your tests are too slow, um, and there's some places where you you already know the distributed nature is OK, but you really are just testing your business logic, it can be a good package for that. Um, there's some interesting bits. Uh, there's there's Spark for, and I've got some, uh, I have a validation package, but it's pretty new, and I don't actually encourage people to use it. I encourage people to look at it and think about what they want to do on their own. Because if you use this code, it will probably break in production, despite being something that tries to not make your software break in production. So it's, it's pretty bad. But it's, it's, a, it's a good sort of guideline. So we can, we can get rid of one slide of boilerplate code. Um, and that's cool. It's not really all that great, but it's, it's a good start, right? So if we use one of these libraries, we can write our, our simple tests like this. Um, but this, this really doesn't handle problems at scale, right? Um, there's a lot of Spark jobs which work fine on, on small size input, right? Anything involving group by key is going to work well with the kind of stuff that I can call parallelize and collect on, but it's totally going to explode when I try and use this in production. Um, so we need to test workloads that are too large for a single machine, right? So we can't just rely on the tests that I showed you. Um, our first problem is we need to actually be able to figure out when the results of our test match our expectations, right? And I can't just you know, collect the result and, and just use a standard equality to compare it. Um, Spark has these distributed set operations, though, and that seems like a, a good start to try and sort of figure out if our data is equal. Um, you can also use RDD comparisons. Uh, there's similar objects available in other ones. Uh, you don't actually have to read this code probably out of date and incorrect anyways, because uh, it's code on slides. Um, and, and this just compares if, if two RDDs are, are equal um, in a distributed fashion. So you can actually test sort of at scale. Um, but testing at scale, we also have to like actually have data at scale to test with. right? If we can assert that they're equal, that's a really good start. 
but, but we need some actual data to test with. Um, how many people have only production data without any user-sensitive values in it? No one. OK. Um, <clears throat> so you may not find that sampling from production works so well for you. Um, if you work at a startup that's kind of like Cowboys, eh, it works. Um, and it turns out 40% uh, of people are able to sample their production data. Um, and maybe not for, for all of their fields. And maybe you, know, you can sample your production data and explicitly anonymize the you know, user-specific fields. Um, but I mean, after Yahoo posted those search logs, we saw how well that worked. Um, so be careful with doing that. Um, Spark has tools internally to actually generate random data for us to work with. Um, it's actually really intended for machine learning, but there's nothing which says we can't use it for our own tests. Um, so yeah, let's, let's look at ScalaCheck. How many people are familiar with ScalaCheck? Cool, that's a, that's a good number. Um, so ScalaCheck is really awesome. Um, it allows us to sort of flip our thinking uh, with how we're going to test. Instead of explicitly thinking about, like, here's my expected input, and here's my expected output for that input, and if you have, like, a really huge data set, like, coming up a golden data set to compare it with that's actually correct could take a fair amount of time and, and be rather unpleasant. Um, so ScalaCheck lets us define properties that should hold true sort of regardless. Um, and I think I might have disconnected from Hangouts. Or just, no, just one of the TVs did. OK, no worries. Um, so there's, there's sort of two options for working with ScalaCheck and Spark. Um, SSCheck, which is really cool. Um, or at least the person seems really cool over email, uh, is, is available. And it has really cool generators to make it simple. Um, and Spark Testing Base also has generators to make it simple. Um, and I think Spark Testing Base is maybe a little better, but as the primary author, I'm maybe a little biased. Um, one of the things that it does is it actually tries to generate sort of really weirdly shaped RDBs. Um, because in production, you'll find like you might have a partition which is completely empty, or you have a partition with a single invalid record in it, and your code kind of assumed that it was always going to be able to output something. And uh, oh dear! And like these are these are actual failures that people have run into, right? So it, it does a good job of generating bad input that is mostly correct that your job should be able to handle. Um, and so writing invariants is really easy. Um, provided that we can do it. So this, this one just says, like, if I'm going to compute the, the length of all of my strings, um, you know, I shouldn't actually be changing the number of elements in the result. And this is really, this is an incredibly trivial property. Um, but you could think about all sorts of things that might be true about your data transformation. But it's really specific on, on whatever it is that you're doing. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, by default, um, it tests on, like, 100 entries which is also, once again, not big data. Uh, so you don't want to tell it, like, I actually want to generate this sort of ridiculous number of, of entries. And your properties and test with one million records. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> I like old bad movies. Um, sorry. Oh, yeah, and, and so the, the sport testing base specific component here is this RDD generator which just generates uh, our distributed collections for us. And here, we're just generating random strings. But if you look at, um, at the Scala test website, you can see how to specify sort of all kinds of different data types. And then you can just pass that in as the template type. And it'll work and be super happy. Uh, what's up next? Great. Um, but doing it this way can get kind of slow, right? Um, not all of our tests actually need to run on 1 million entries, right? There's, there's probably a really good chance that we're going to do something really specific on a per user basis. And for that, we don't want to have to set up and tear down a Spark context for each one of our tests. Uh, or even if we have a shared Spark context, like distributing our data to a distributed collection is kind of slow compared to just like testing it locally really quickly. Um, if you, if you just like have business logic that's inside of a lambda, you can factor it out into a function and just test it with that specific function. And that's, that's going to work pretty well. Um, but on the other hand, probably you're going to have some business logic sort of implicitly encoded in your Spark transformations. And you're going to want to be able to test that your Spark transformations are actually you know, the correct ones to be doing 
regardless of whether or not like the serializability of things are working out. Uh, and for that, you can use this new project whose name I cannot pronounce, but I have a link to on my final slide. Um, and it, it sort of provides these mock RDDs that you can work on and mock data frames. So I mean, everyone knows how to get rid of a lambda and write it as an explicit function. Um, one thing to be aware of in Spark when doing this is if you just put your function inside of the same class and then you reference it, um, there's a really good chance Spark is going to pick up that class and serialize it for you, because it's real helpful like that. The only problem is picking up the class with all of your functions in it and serializing it probably isn't what you wanted Spark to do, right? So just, just make sure that you put your, your functions like this that you're going to reference inside of your lambda, inside of your transformations, inside of an object. Um, and, and normally it'll fail, um, which is good, right? You'll, you'll see like not serializable error, and you're like, oh, I just need to move this code. But sometimes if you've marked your objects as serializable, it'll work, it'll just be slower, because it's serializing this object a whole bunch of times for each one of the workers, and it's, it's just kind of a waste. So something to be aware of. Um, here's an example using the, the library from the, the very fine person that emailed me. Um, it is also relatively new um, and possibly not something you want to use in production. But if you're interested in working with mock RDDs over real RDDs, uh, it's definitely something to check out and consider if it might work for you. Uh, another thing is, in addition to sort of working with data that we can generate using uh, Scala check, we can also sometimes just want to generate our own data and then write our own rules about it. Um, Spark has random RDDs, uh, and this object has a bunch of different standard things, exponential RDD, normal vector RDD, and just really whatever kind of random doubles you want, it's really good at generating random doubles. If you want like random strings or like random case classes, that's not really its jam. And you should probably go back to like Scala check and, and something which makes it really easy to do that. Um, but you can provide like custom subclasses to it and do that all yourself if you decide that my code is complete crap and you don't want to use it. I, I don't judge you at all. I understand completely. So streaming. How many people are using or have considered using you know, Spark streaming? Is there? OK, not too many people. Um, I think streaming is really cool. It's also kind of like lava running down the side of the hill when it comes to testing, which is really, really cool looking, but also, oh god, I need to get away from the lava. Um, so an artisanal streaming test is multiple slides of crap. Um, as opposed to one slide of like not that much stuff. Uh, so while you can write your own artisanal uh, Spark streaming tests, I don't really encourage you to do it unless you like wake up every morning and go like, I really want to write boilerplate code. Uh, in which case, you probably want to pick a different language to be working in anyways. Um, <clears throat> uh, but anyways, you probably don't want to write your streaming test by hand. Right? I'm like, oh god, I, it's still not done. I forgot how many slides there were. OK, here are the promised pandas. They're very happy. You can see they're going down a slide like a screen. Um, and just like Spark, they're discrete chunks of pandas rather than continuous pandas. <laughs> uh, yay, jokes. So creating test data is hard with streaming. Um, and I don't mean this in like, I need to figure out how to make a whole bunch of like random case classes. I mean, uh, it's actually hard to, to sort of set up a test D stream. Oh, that should have been on my slide with terms I was going to use. OK, um, jumping back a bit, a D stream is a discretized stream. Uh, and you can just think of it as Spark's really awesome distributed stream thing. Uh, it uses RDDs under the hood, and it uses time slices rather than continuous things, hence the Panda reference. Um, but yeah. So there is there's this thing. Um, if you're working in Spark prior to 1.4.1, you should really upgrade. But you could use this thing to generate your test data. Um, getting our data back is also kind of painful. Um, another option for, for getting your test data is you can actually do integration testing, right? Like you can stand up a Kafka client um, and like start sending data to it. But if that's what you have to do for your unit tests, like you're probably going to be like the I really don't want to test this. And you're going to end up with like the really sad red 25% test coverage, and it's, it's not a good time. 
right? Um, so we, we want something more usable than standing up a Kafka cluster for each one of our unit tests. Um, collecting the data back locally is kind of ugly. Um, there's no sort of like local comparison or, or collect equivalent. Um, I used to say hard, but it's mostly, it's not actually hard, it's just ugly because there's a var and vars make me sad. So I want to hide all of my vars so I can pretend that I'm working with really nice code even, even if under the hood it's all bad. Um, and the, the thing which actually like should have been really obvious to me when I started writing streaming tests but wasn't is that figuring out when your test is done is actually kind of hard. Spark doesn't have a great idea of, like, I've processed all of the data. Um, it just has a, like, empty batch. And, like, you, you need to actually know when you've processed all of the data, because otherwise you do terrible things, like sleep for 100 milliseconds and assert that the result is equal. And when I see that code, I cry. Because that code is, is wasting a whole bunch of time on my tests. And it's also going to be flaky for the one day that the test server is like decides to GC in the middle of my event, right? And no one wants flaky slow tests, right? So we actually want a better solution than sleeping for 100 milliseconds. But we can hide all of this. We can hide all of our problems um, inside of a test operation. Uh, and it's really simple. This test looks like the, the really simple test that I showed you all for the, the Gary first thing. Um, tokenize here is, is the, the Lambda that I'm testing. It takes and returns a, a discretized string. Um, but I, I can just give it my input, my expected output, and everything will just work. Great. And I can pretend that everything is OK. I'm not working with streaming data, and I'm not running away from Lava. And it's going to be fine. Um, how many people work with data frames, data sets, or SQL, or want to? OK. Yay! That's everyone. Um, so we've got a few options for testing data frames. Uh, one, one thing is we can take our RDBs, turn them into data frames, and then do a whole bunch of operations on them, turn them back into RDBs, and then just use the testing tools that I've already talked about. Um, oh. Ah, OK. Sorry. This shouldn't say validation. That should say testing. Sorry. My apologies. Anyways, um, the other option is we can actually use some data frame specific testing stuff. Uh, inside of Spark's internal code, uh, there's this expect, there's this check answer function, um, which is pretty good. It takes a data frame and a sequence of rows. Um, the only problem is this doesn't actually assert that the schema uh, matches what we're expecting, so we could be missing some information here. Um, well, we'd probably find it while inspecting the individual elements, but, but not for sure. Um, the other one is it's not even available for us to use if we wanted to. It's an internal function, so we can't use it. Um, instead, um, Spark Testing Base exposes these two things to test the quality of the data frames. Uh, and SS Check and, and the other one also expose similar functions, all with different names to keep you on your toes. Um, and because we don't talk to each other all that much. But we, we can do this, this standard comparison, and it's really cool. Um, and data sets with our, with our wonderful types, um, we, can, we can actually do our super here. We'll just compare our data sets. Um, there's also, because I'm a really terrible person, and well, I am, uh, I have this sort of general tolerance. Because most of us are working with floating point uh, information, especially in data sets uh, and data frames. Um, and I got tired of like having my test fail all the time. And strangely enough, Spark's check answer doesn't have a general tolerance. Um, you, if this doesn't match your use case, you have to collect the data locally and compare each row uh, on your own, um, which is kind of sad. And having one tolerance for an entire data set is also kind of bad, but I'm really lazy, and it's good enough, and that's sort of my motto. Um, so it, it works, um, but if you need like a per column specific tolerance, uh, you're on your own. You get to collect the data back and, and compare each column on your own. Um, so there's some slightly ugly bits uh, to, to actually compare it. Uh, but there's a very cute cat to make up for the ugly bits of having to import. We can also use a generator. So data frames have this schema information. Uh, and we can actually just take the Spark schema, and we can ask Spark testing base to generate a generator for us. And it'll like, I mean, at least 80% of the time work. 
Um, <laughs> which is not that good, but you don't have to do anything. So like 80% of the time not having to do something is good. And if it doesn't work, you, you can just write your own generator, right? Uh, so if we have a, a schema for, for our data set, uh, and we, we presumably do if we've actually written our code, uh, you can call dataset.schema to get the schema information um, at runtime in the Spark shop and just copy it in here. And it'll, it'll do all sorts of happy things. Um, <clears throat> it says complex types in future versions, and that's probably a lie. Um, but if anyone feels like contributing complex types in future versions, you can turn my slight lie into less of a lie. And the really nice thing about this is it has built-in large data support. Um, it doesn't collect the stuff back locally. Uh, besides looking at the schema, it, it does all distributed comparisons. Um, so you don't have to worry about doing weird things to make it work in a distributed system. Um, yeah, so if none of these things are really good for generating data, right? you actually have a special snowflake that you need to generate some data for. Is the building on fire? <laughs> pizza. It's a crisis. Oh, no. OK. Um, does anyone have a pizza hidden underneath their chair? <laughs> no. OK. I tried. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, random RDBs live in MLlib, but you can use them sort of regardless of what you're working with. Um, and this is the list of supported types. Uh, and for vector, it just supports all of these types, but for an arbitrary number of fields. Um, if you want to, you could implement the random data generator interface yourself, uh, and then you can use random RDDs to, to generate your data. Um, you probably don't want to, just, just use one of the libraries, but if the libraries don't meet your needs, you, you can do it on your own. Here's some more random RDDs. Uh, the unicorns are covering up the size, um, but I assure you it's, it's there. Um, and this is from Dolores Park from anyone from San Francisco. No, OK. Um, and, and so one of the sort of frustrating things with the random RDD generator is it doesn't do a real great job of like generating a bunch of different types of data and distributions. Um, and you can sort of fix it by, by zipping your stuff together, and it's kind of janky. Um, and this can be an alternative to writing your own custom generator. So here, we've got uh, something that's keyed by a string. Uh, and our, our key has one distribution, but our data has a separate distribution, right? And that's that's like a pretty common case, right? Like if we're keyed by zip code, it's going to have a very sort of like mm, mm, and like our data on our customers, I don't know. Hopefully, they all give you lots of money, but it's probably not actually just like everyone's over here. You probably have a very okay. So I've been hiding terrible things from you, much like these cats. Uh, they ate all the treats and hid. Um, and what I've been hiding is local mode. <coughs> so local mode is actually really good. Um, and, and I don't say this very easily, right? It's, it's actually pretty good at catching a lot of the things that you would find in a real distributed system. Um, Spark's local mode goes through all of the work that it has to do when it's working in a distributed system, uh, serializing your data and doing all sorts of, like, serializing all your functions, doing all of that stuff. But it is only local mode, and then you're you're only testing on one machine, and yeah, you know, that's, that's not actually really all that good. Um, and sort of the tests I've shown you all run in local mode, um, but that's okay because switching it to run from local mode to running in an actual test cluster is incredibly simple. Um, all we have to do is point it at a new place, right? Um, and so what are our options? If you have a like standalone test cluster. Uh, or if you have like a Yarn or a Mesos cluster, um, just just point your test code at that master, and it'll just work. Um, all of these things are, are really awesome. Um, do you feel like starting a cluster with shell scripts? Not the worst thing in the world. Um, I've definitely written some of those shell scripts. It's kind of sad. Um, on the other hand, there's also Spark Docker, and there's also this thing called Yarn Mini Cluster which, while it's limited to a single machine, um, does a bunch of work to actually stand up a whole bunch of separate workers in different JVMs and actually do an even more thorough emulation of a real cluster. Um, you can't use it before Spark 1.5.2, but if you're on Spark 1.5.2 or earlier, you probably want to upgrade anyways. Just upgrade. Um, Docker is really awesome. 
for, for really anything. For your integration testing, there's, there's all kinds of Docker packages for all the different components that you're probably going to end up using with Spark and Kafka. Um, how many people have looked at Juju Trans? I assure you this is probably a real word. Um, it's from the, the really nice people at Canonical. And they have these really simple tools to deploy um, a whole bunch of Docker images uh, together in a way where they're all talking to each other. And they're pre-set up. And so if you find one that's pretty close to what your actual testing environment looks like, or what your actual integration environment looks like, Juju Charms is really, really easy and really great. Um, and it, it's really nice because you can run it locally for when you're working on your laptop on the train home. And when you're using it in your actual like CI environment, you can actually point it at a, whole, uh, at a proper cluster, and it will deploy on an actual cluster. Um, so I encourage people to check out Juju Charms with, of course, the warning that like it's new, and all new things probably don't work. Um, but you'll find the bugs, and then everyone will be happy. Um, I'm just a little bit cynical from playing Pokemon Go today. <sighs> Almost caught the Charmander. Anyways, uh, it, was, it was sad. That's so sad. Did someone catch a Charmander? It's the first one I caught it, but it's like default. Oh, no. Okay. It's the only one I have. I started in San Francisco on Thursday, and there was a bug, and I could only catch one Pokemon, and it wasn't Charmander. I caught a Squirtle. Um, but that's completely off topic. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll talk more about Pokemon later. <laughs> um, okay, let's, let's be real. Um, actually, yeah, thank you for coming despite Pokemon Go being out. <laughs> I'm really impressed that I, like, you all managed to show up. Play it on the way. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, yeah, no, no, this is the wonderful thing with Pokemon Go. Um, yeah, uh, I'm predicting the Spark release is going to be a little late this time because of Pokemon, <laughs> but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Um, if, you, if you have an existing Yarn or Mises cluster that you're using for testing, it's really, it's really simple to do integration testing with Spark. Just you know, point your Spark cluster at your existing Yarn and Mesos integration cluster. If you don't have one, you should probably set one up and, and use it. Um, it's really, in my opinion, it's, it's one of the best ways to, to really do proper integration testing. Um, even if you're deploying Spark in standalone mode, I think for integration testing, testing with something like Yarn um, is, is really good because it, you can actually have, like, some nice scheduling pools. And you can make sure that like your test jobs, like if one of them gets wedged, it's actually going to get killed properly, and you don't have to like dedicate extra admin time to, to keeping your cluster alive. Um, and for people with streaming integration, if there weren't a lot of you. Come talk to me. Um, it's sad, but it's doable. Um, so validation. Let's make sure we don't fuck up in production. Um, I think if you have uh, sort of an integration testing environment, you should also enable your validation tests during integration testing, um, because they can catch some additional bugs that, that we're going to show up in production. Um, not always, of course, like when Bob changes the meaning of the field, and you're just really sad. It's not going to catch that. Um, so how do we validate our jobs? There's a whole bunch of really interesting statistics from Spark itself that we can use to validate our jobs. Um, Spark has sort of a whole bunch of internal counters. Um, it has per stage bytes read and written, shuffle bytes read and written, um, the number of records, our execution time, right? If our job finishes really, really quickly, uh, that's, I mean, either we're, we became really awesome coders yesterday or something has gone terribly wrong. Um, and my default is to assume something has gone terribly wrong. Maybe for it's different. That's cool. um, the records that are written is, is a really simple validation to perform. Um, if the number of users is going down, it's probably not a good sign. Um, you might as well fail the job because you're going to be sending out resumes anyways. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, if the number of users like goes up by a factor of 100, that's also probably not a great sign either unless you're Pokemon Go, in which case that's cool. Um, we can add our own counters for the things that we care about, right? So Spark's internal counters are pretty good, but we might actually have some business-specific logic that we actually care about validating, right? We might care about validating the number of users who are in arrears, right? Like, if that has all of a sudden spiked, like, maybe it means we drop some payment data on the ground. Um, and so we can add our own counters for the things we care about. Um, there are some challenges with them. Accumulators in the current version of Spark 
don't work super well. Um, you could drop the second part of the phrase as well if you wanted to. Um, either way, essentially, they, they have some problems when they're interacting with cache data um, or partial evaluation of data and all sorts of tricks that you can do to make your Spark job fast that you're probably going to do to make your Spark job fast. Um, and so accumulators don't, don't work super well when you're doing these things. But it's OK, because you can just take relative rules. Um, and essentially what this means is, while these accumulators might get evaluated multiple times on some of our data, if we're always comparing sort of the number of good records to the number of bad records, the fact that we evaluate that we executed it twice it shouldn't really matter, right? The, the percentage is the part that we care about. Um, and that's close enough to true that you can pretend it's true. Um, so rather than doing the number of users, you know, you, you might do like the number of users relative to some other thing you were processing, like the number of transactions. Um, I think historic rules are really useful. Um, so you can write absolute rules that are like, you know, I should always have more than a thousand users. But like, if that was your startup and you only had a thousand users, and tomorrow you have a million users. When you go back down to 1,000, that's going to be kind of sad, right? Your, your validation rule isn't going to catch it. Um, so what you should say is like this thing should be greater than yesterday, or it should be greater than my moving average, or it should be similar to what last year was if I'm in retail. And I have like one of those little Amazon graphs where like it goes up. And then when the soccer match happens in Europe, your validation rule fails, but you know there's a soccer match, so you can manually mark it as successful. Um, and that's really that's really one of the important things I think about validation rules is they shouldn't be a hard stop, right? Um, you should log the error, not deploy to production, but log the error and notify someone so that you can go and take a look and be like, oh yeah, there was a soccer match. There wasn't a soccer match last year. It's okay that our transactions look differently. Or like Pokemon Go launch today. It's normal that we sold out of battery packs. It's okay. Um, there is Spark Validator if you're interested in looking at sort of some tooling around doing this. Um, I call it a proof of concept. Uh, so you should write your own validation rules. But Spark Validator will show you some of the things that I think are, are useful in writing validation rules, but is maybe not like super finished. Um, and from, from talking to people, most people are pretty lazy and don't actually bother evaluating um, sort of business specific logic. But most people do actually do really simple checking on file sizes and execution time. And if you don't do any other validation rules, at least validate your, your output sizes and your execution time. Because it's really simple. You don't even have to use like a weird project. You can, you can just write those rules by hand. And it'll probably save you at some point. Because if the number of records drop, it'll implicitly impact the file sizes and execution time. Um, here's a really simple rule um, written in our system. And you can see that the individual in question has dropped all of their bowling pins. Um, and so clearly, the validation rule did not succeed. Um, but, but this is just really simple. right? We can validate that our records read should be between some numbers. Um, awesome. So that's, I hope, yeah, that was hopefully the third one. Um, so there's a whole bunch of related talks and blog posts also on testing. If after this you're like, oh my god, I'm so excited about software testing. I'm going to go home, not play Pokemon Go for a few hours, or I'm going to play Pokemon Go, and then when I can't walk anymore, I'm going to go read some blog posts. Um, I really encourage you to check some of these out. Um, admittedly, once again, I was involved with some of them, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, this time I didn't tell you which ones I was involved with, so like... It's a mystery. But you'll figure it out, because there's pictures of cats. Um, <laughs> and other people seem more professional than I am, so that's cool. Um, there's a whole bunch of related packages for helping making your testing sort of easier. Uh, these are the sort of Spark-specific ones. For anyone that's working in Scala, I really encourage you to check out Scala Check, regardless of if you're working with Spark or not. I think property checking is really amazing. Um, and I think Scala Check is, is a really great library for doing it. Um, and, and I encourage everyone to use it. If you're, if you're really jazzed about Spark testing base and you're not dissuaded by my mentions of things that don't work, um, you can include it with your package. Um, if you build with SBT, here you go. If you're a native user, here you go. 
Um, <laughs> uh, well, to be fair, SBT and Spark are sometimes very exciting um, in that, oh god. Um, and so, so I, I understand people that, upon looking at their build, decide to go with Maven, not judge. It's OK. Whatever build system you want, Maven, SBT, Gradle, we're all friends. We're all friends. Um, oh, question. Do you support uh, earlier than 161? Yes, I do. Um, 161, when I made this slide, 161 was the current release. Um, and this is actually available for 162 as well. Uh, I think I support 130 through 162 uh, for, for the actual prod release ones. But if you're on like 130, please upgrade. There are a lot of really bad bugs. Please upgrade. Um, and not, not, not just in Minecraft, but there's a lot of that. Um, is anyone here using Spark 2.0 Preview Edition? <gasps> OK, one person, two people. Yay! The slide was useful. Um, if you want to use Spark 2.0 Preview, um, there's a preview version of the testing library as well available for you to start using. Um, and it's cool, and it works, but it's also preview. Um, so if you find bugs in it, please let me know, and we'll fix them along with the actual Spark 2.0 release. Um, there's a bunch of like sort of future work that I've got planned. Um, please fill out the survey to help me figure out what it is that you all want when you're testing. Um, I would love to, to make things that are useful to people, as opposed to just things that are useful to the people in my head, um, who are very friendly. Um, if you like giving me money, uh, you can buy my next book, uh, which will have some testing details. Testing um, <coughs> unfortunately, it's, it's not very likely that we'll see the testing stuff go into Spark Core itself. Um, if you are interested in seeing the reasons why, you can look at this JIRA and the corresponding mailing list discussion. Uh, I Anyways, um, there are a bunch of Spark books. Um, and I'm going to tell you not to buy one of the books that I wrote, which is really weird. And it's actually the one where I get the most money for it. Um, so like, you should really trust me on at least a not buying part. Do not buy the first edition of Fast Data Processing with Spark. It is really, really out of date. It's like Spark 0.7.0. <laughs> and it has many useful properties, like um, keeping doors open. Uh, <laughs> but it's probably not worth money. Although, I mean, if you have a corporate credit card and you're just like, Holden seems like a real cool lady, I want to give her money, <laughs> buy many copies of that. Actually, buy the ebook version of it several times over. Um, uh, more seriously, I, I think these other books are very good. And I, didn't, I wasn't even involved with writing this one, and I think it's good. And I get no money from it. Um, so you can clearly trust me on that one. Do you have a new version of the Lord of the Spark? Unfortunately, no. Um, it's 1.3. It is Spark 1.3. For reasons that we can talk about offline, there is no updated version of that in the pipeline right now. But ah, High Performance Spark covers Spark 2.0, which is not even released yet. Um, relatedly, High Performance Spark is not released yet. Um, but it's in early review. Uh, parts of it are, the version that's in early review right now is, is against 1.6.2. Um, but the next version that we'll, we'll have out there will be updated for Spark 2.0. Um, and you can check it out. It covers how to make your Spark job super fast. But another large part of what it covers is essentially learning Spark Part 2, Electric Boogaloo. Um, of, of just sort of like the things that are new in Spark 2.0 that are important for performance considerations. Um, if you want to give me your email address to spam the help, uh, <coughs> selectively contact, um, <coughs> highperformancespark.com, uh, you can give me your email address. Uh, you can also go and buy this book from O'Reilly. I do get money when you buy this book, so this is an excellent book. And several copies for everyone. I recommend a copy for home, the car, the train, <laughs> work, and your dog. And if you have a cat, cats love this book. <laughs> um, sorry. Copy for each washroom dogs. Oh, yeah. No, it, it's great bathroom. Um, 
point. I assure you, it's wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Um, people that don't even know much about computers will also enjoy this book. <laughs> um, to be fair, I, there is some unfortunate news. They won't let me put pictures of cats in an O'Reilly book on every page. Um, I did chat with my editor, and she was like, no, it is not professional. And I said, have you seen me? Um, but so if you're looking for pictures of cats, I encourage you to check out my slides uh, for my other talks. Um, but also, definitely buy the book. That's a good question. Um, it is scheduled for uh, September. That's not happening. Um, <laughs> My guess is like November, December. November. Yeah. Um, but definitely give us money today. <laughs> <laughs> um, because you need some lattice to the right book. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Actually, uh, I got my first royalty check for this book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Spend it on coffee. Um, <laughs> you got two or one? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to know. Um, <laughs> But yeah, if if you if you pre-order it, maybe we'll write it faster. Probably not. Um, but we could pretend that's the case. Um, what I've, is uh, Spark Two? Uh, yeah, I'm scheduled to release. That's a really great question. Uh, Spark Two is an RC two. Um, when it actually releases, I don't know. Pokemon Go came out, so all bets are off. <laughs> <laughs> like. Um, I did not look at any PRs today. I run around Toronto catching Pokemon. Um, did and you I was find any dead bodies? No, no dead bodies. <laughs> Toronto's a very nice city. Uh, compared to running around San Francisco at 1 a.m. looking for Pokemon. Uh, I gotta say, you have a much nicer city. Um, <clears throat> You're always welcome back. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have some more talks. Um, there is one tentatively, probably, in September. Um, we will see. Uh, but when it happens, I'll tweet about it. Uh, so if you follow me on Twitter, I'll, I'll spam the hell out of you. Um, there's this meetup. Wait, today is it? Yeah. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to New York to talk about PySpark. If anyone feels like doing the short hop to Toronto to chat about PySpark, um, sorry, Scala meetup. Uh, we, we can hang out and be friends. Um, and I'm also going to give a talk in Seattle, um, at Data Day Seattle, in nine days. If anyone wants to come and hang out in Seattle, uh, I still need to figure out what that talk is on, but I'm sure it's going to be great. Uh, it'll probably be Spark Performance with a preview of structured streaming for people that are really excited about streaming. Um, Strata, and yeah, is anyone going to OSCon in London? I will bring Bud Light Line from America. <laughs> and the, the 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 Brits won't drink it with me. Uh, they just they just they just know better. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's it. Um, I have this survey if you want to fill it out um, and, and let me know what you what you think about testing. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you.